In practice, we'll never have populations small enough where we'll ever be able to form a real sampling distribution like this. So instead, to learn about how we'll make inferences from sampling distributions, let's approximate a sampling distribution, something that we've already been doing. But let's review the steps on how we would approximate a sampling distribution. First, we'll choose some kind of population. Next, we'll take a random sample of size n. Next, we'll calculate the mean for that particular sample, we'll record the mean to a table, and then we'll go back to number two and repeat this 100,000 times, or some number of times that gives us a reasonable approximation of what the real sampling distribution looks like. In the journal that accompanies today's lecture, go to the section with a large population and click normal n equals two. Let me orient you to this data set. We again have a column that's gonna take the mean of one observation and another observation. Now these observations won't be drawn from a binomial and they won't be drawn from that simple distribution with values of one to 10. Instead, these observations will be drawn from an infinite population that is normally distributed. One with the properties of the IQ distribution, that is a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Let me show you how I'm doing this. I'll right click observation one and go to formula. And what I'm using in this formula is the random normal function, which returns a value from the Z distribution, that is a distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And then what I'm doing is multiplying that value by 15 and adding back 100. This is that formula we used to go from a Z score to an X score. Now, so you know, the random normal function can actually take on the arguments of a mean and a standard deviation, but I wanted to do it this way so you can see that this is the same thing we were doing when converting a z-score to an x-score. So every row in this data set will get a random draw from a population that's centered at 100 with a standard deviation of 15. Now observation one and two both do this, but they're independent. That is, whatever observation I get on observation one has nothing to do with the observation I get for observation two. They are independent. So just like we do with any independent observations, we can think of their joint probability as simply being the products. Now, so we have a little bit of something to rest this on, something physical. I'll go back to that little demonstration I had before, and instead of using a binomial, let me click over to normal 100. Now, this little block is taking on the same properties as our observations. That is, it's drawn from a population with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. In order to represent our situation here, I'm gonna add one more block. Let me add another column. So now we have two blocks, and every time I click go, it's simply drawing a random value for each of these different blocks. Again, it'll compute a mean, and that's the mean we're interested in. We wanna know what types of sample means do we expect when we're taking samples of size two from a population centered at 100 with a standard deviation of 15. Now, also like before, I don't wanna click this button 100,000 times and record this value to a data set. That's simply gonna to take too long. So instead, let's let jump compute our 100,000 observations. Like we did before, we simply have to add rows to this table. So I'll go to the rows menu and go to add rows. Here, I'll type in 100,000. When I click okay, jump will compute the 100,000 observations for observation one, observation two, and for each of the different samples, remember each sample here is a row, we'll find a sample mean. Let's take a look at the observation ones, twos, and sample means we obtained. To do this, I'll go to the analyze menu and select distribution. Let's take all of these observations, or all of these columns rather, and put them into the Y roll, and I'll click okay. Now what I wanna do, I'll hide the quantiles and summary statistics first, but what I wanna do is put these all on the same scale. You might notice that our observations one and two actually go up a little higher and go down a little lower. And this we should expect by now. When we take a mean, we're actually pulling in the distribution. Extreme values are less likely than they are in the population themselves. So let's actually go to the topmost red triangle and select uniform scaling. To fix the distribution so they don't look so ugly, let's go to the tools menu use the graver, and I'll drag each of these to the right. Now immediately, we can see something important about the distribution of sample means with sample sizes of two. First, the shape is normally distributed. 
Now, this is something we'll come back to. When we have a population that is normally distributed, every sampling distribution formed from that population will also have a normal shape. Normal distributions beget normal distributions. The second thing you should observe is that the center of our sampling distribution of the mean is right at 100. If I expand the summary statistics, you can see it's very, very close, 100.0009. Now, the true sampling distribution from this population with sample sizes of two has a mean that is exactly 100. We have a sampling distribution of 100,000 randomly selected samples. Now, there's a plenty more samples out there. We didn't collect all of them. We simply took 100,000 randomly selected ones. So the mean of this sampling distribution, our approximation of the sampling distribution, isn't exactly 100. But don't let that fool you. This sampling distribution is a good representation of the true sampling distribution. Now, the final thing you should notice is that our sampling distribution is a little bit less variable than the populations. Notice the standard deviation of our sampling distribution is 10.59. Let me expand the summary statistics for our observations, which in essence are representations of the populations themselves, and notice they have a standard deviation right around 15. That was the population characteristic we defined in our formulas. So, the insight here is that it's harder to get an extreme sample mean when we're taking means of sample sizes of two than it is to simply pull a random observation in the tails. For instance, notice in observation one and two, we actually did observe a few individuals with IQs above 140, but we never observed a sample, a sample of size two, with a mean of 140. That was simply too extreme to get. Now to see this, Let's go back to that analyze fit y by x, and let's actually plot observation 1 against observation 2. In this way, we can see what it would take to get a mean that is very extreme. When I click OK, we're going to get a big mess of data points. There is actually a lot of data here, and so the center is really uh, filled in here. We can get a little bit of a better sense of how dense it is in the center if I right-click and go to transparency. And I'm going to set the transparency of the points down to 0.25. If I do this, it'll take a little bit of time, but what Jump will do is actually change the transparency of the points so we can see a little bit more of the density here. It's still a very dense area in the middle. Most of the samples, most of the observations are right here in the center, and those reflect the sample means that are fairly central. But notice what it would take for us to get an extreme sample mean, where we'd have to get an observation in this bivariate plot. For instance, if I wanted to get a very low sample mean, something down here at 60 or 70, let me go back to the bivariate, that's this tiny, tiny corner of this bivariate plot. Think about throwing a dart. It would be unlikely to hit this bottom corner. It's much more likely you're going to hit the center, and that center will yield a sample mean right near 100. Now, it is actually a little bit deceiving to look at it this way. We need to really represent the mass in the center here. And to show you that, I'll do something quickly. I'm going to turn on non-parametric densities, which will give us density contours showing us where the most mass is of the distribution. The vast majority of the mass is right here in the center. There's actually not a lot of observations relative to how many we have that are beyond this circle here in the outside. So to get a sample mean in the extreme portion, again, let me select it in the mean distribution, to get one of those sample means, it's actually a very unlikely event. Now, a final way to see this, and I'm going to do it fairly quickly, so don't worry about following along, is I'm going to save the density grid. And what I want to do is actually look at the density grid in a surface plot. So I'm going to go to the graph menu, and I'm going to go to surface plot. Here, I'm going to select observation 2, 1, and the density, and once I get this output, I'm going to turn on a surface. And actually, maybe I'll turn on a mesh to make it a little cleaner. And what we can do is look at the density of these observations. That is, where we got observations in that bivariate space. The vast majority of observations, the bivariate observations, are right here in the center. Remember, to get one of the extreme means, we had to sample from a corner. And that is very few times out of the 100,000 observations, it was very unlikely. And so going back, we can see the reason why it's very unlikely to get extreme sample means is because it's just an unlikely sampling event. If we get an observation for the first person who's down at 60, 
Well, it's very likely on the second observation we're going to get somebody towards the center. That will always balance out the sample mean. And so even with samples of size 2, it's already becoming unlikely to get extreme sample means, something we'll see as we get larger and larger samples.